Welcome to Teacher Tuesdays. I'm Bonnie Goonan and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Before we get started, just a couple technical things for everyone. Um, if you did use your phone to call in, be sure that you did enter the appropriate codes and just note that when you logged on, we did mute all of your audio and it will be muted so that we avoid a lot of background noise. Um, if you've not hand have or downloaded the handouts, you can feel free to do so. You'll note that on the right hand side of the screen it says handouts to. That's probably the easiest way to do that. Also, we have something brand new today that we're really excited about and that is the fact that you can connect with us on Twitter. So throughout today's webinar, Mimi is going to be tweeting, so just realize we will have a live tweet going and if you have questions, you may either tweet those questions in or put them in the chat box. So having said that, Mimi, if you start the recording, we can get started. Welcome to Scientific Minds Want to Know, Strategies for Addressing High Impact Areas of the GED Science Test. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of GED Testing Service. I'm Bonnie Goonan and with me today we have Debbie Fawcett and Daphne Atkinson. Susan Pittman is not with us today. She's actually in the air on her way to North Dakota, so we wish her well going into some chilly weather up there. What we're going to be talking about today are those high impact indicators for science. And as we go through today, we're going to identify some strategies, activities, and experiments for your classroom, as well as reviewing some issues and concerns that are related to science short answers. As you have questions, again, please chat them in because we will have time to work on those as we go through and specifically at the end of this training. I found this quote oh, many, many years ago, and it's so apropos. If it's green or wiggles, it's biology. If it stinks, it's chemistry. And if it doesn't work, it's physics. And sometimes we feel like that because our students are not always aware of the things that they need to know about science. In fact, many of my students said to me, you know, why do I need to know about science? Or, you know, I never got to have any fun in science because that just wasn't something that I was allowed to do. So we're going to have a little bit of fun in science. But before we get started, let's take a look Back. In fact, there are some great websites to set the stage for whatever lectures you're doing in science, and it's called Today in Science or This Day in Science History. If we look back at what happened today in science, some things are pretty amazing. In fact, well over, oh gosh, about 150 years ago, the 100-mile-long Suez Canal opens. I can't imagine how folks did all of that kind of building that many years ago. And in 1951, or as I like to say, a very good year, the first nuclear-powered heating system was developed. For those of us who grew up in, you know, that wonderful space time, Surveyor 6 made the first lunar liftoff for a flight of six seconds. And of course, we also know that the computer, very important in today's world, back in 1970, the first patent for a computer mouse was issued. But it wasn't called a computer mouse, it was called an XY indicator. And although we may not think anything of it in today's world, artificial blood was first used in a patient by transfusion back in 79. And, you know, we all love animals. Let's take it to the animals. The world's oldest polar bear died at age 41 in 2008. So, now that we've set the stage a little bit with some interesting things from science, let's look at those high impact indicators because that's what we're going to be focusing on today. And just know that these high impact indicators came through ongoing research from the GED testing service and they identify these indicators for all of the different content areas. You know, this type of a tool is absolutely marvelous for us to use in our classroom and we'll talk a little bit more about how they can be useful. But 
what are high impact indicators? Well, first of all, how were they determined? The GED testing service, what they did was they analyzed test taker performance on the operational GED test. And what they did was they examined the differences in performance between those test takers who scored between a 140 to 149 and those who scored 150 to 159 each content area. And those results were then examined based upon the areas that you see on this, this slide. GED Testing Service decided what were the important skills that were wild, widely applicable and how much coverage did those skills receive during GED test preparation. And just as importantly, were the high impact indicators that were selected, did they lend themselves to straightforward instruction? And yes, they did. Let's break it down. We have three elements when we talk about high impact indicators. We've seen those assessment targets since before the test came out and, and those assessment targets have helped us in our programs determine what are those big ideas or general concepts that are assessed by this test. But now what we see are indicators, they're descriptions of the skills that students need to have and, and what I really like about the um, high impact indicators is GED testing service has also described for us what to look for in student work. To me that last piece is the, of the best value for those of us in the classroom because it basically sets up objectives for our lessons. But that's kind of a broad based um, definition of what a high impact indicator is. What I'd like to know is what are they in science? You all were provided with a workbook guide, and we'll go to that in a little bit, but just realize that a more readable approach for these is on page three of your guide. But these are the science high impact indicators, and no, I didn't do a typo going from 2B to 2E. There are things in the middle of that. However, when we look at these indicators, it's real clear to see that one of the important things that we need to be teaching in the classroom is how to identify and refine hypotheses for the scientific design or investigations, what independent dependent variables are, and of course whether conclusion is supported or challenged by data or evidence. You know, Daphne and I were just talking not too long ago about how evidence is everywhere. It's in RLA, it's in social studies, and when we look at these high impact indicators for science, evidence is also there. And you also notice that other high impact indicators for science are can our students express scientific information visually, can they look at charts, tables, graphs, and can they apply formulas from the different scientific theories. But as I said, what I like about these is to really look a little bit deeper. And as I'm looking at certain indicators, to know what students should be able to do. Take a quick look at this slide. The indicators are identify and refine hypotheses for scientific investigations and identify and interpret independent and dependent variables in scientific investigations. What does that mean? What should I see students do if they've mastered those skills? Well, I should see whether students can identify a hypothesis for a given investigation. So if students have a problem on the science test and they're asked which would be the best hypothesis for a scenario that's provided, they should be able to know what creates an effective hypothesis. And they should be able to use that to support or challenge a given conclusion. That sounds like one of those short answer science questions to me, where students are given the scenario they're given the hypothesis and then they need to write up that experimental design to either support it or challenge it. You see all over here the words of science, the words of scientific design. So as I look at this specific high impact indicator, I know what kind of lesson I need to develop so that students can show me that they're able to do that. More on that later as we go through today because what we're going to take are a couple of these high impact indicators and we're going to create some sample lessons. 
that will help not only us in the classroom, but more importantly, help our students show us that they're able to do this. The great Carl Sagan once says, science is a way of thinking much more than it is a body of knowledge. One of the questions that we often get when we're doing workshops is, what do my students need to know? What is the specific content knowledge that my students need to know? And as I'm looking at so many of the materials and as we've talked with GED Testing Service, it is not just about content. More importantly, it's about problem solving, critical thinking. And there again, please don't hear me say there's not some big ideas our students need to know, but it's not about those discrete facts, but rather can they critically think, can they problem solve, and can they basically just determine the basic steps of the scientific design and what supports it. One area that students need to better understand, again, is scientific method or experimental design. So when I heard that, I thought, hmm, how deep would I need to teach students this process? Well, this is a sample question from the GED testing service. And students or test takers are provided with the setup that there's this hypothesizing from enver environmental researchers that increasing the number of water holes will improve the health of a desert biome. And students are asked which hypothesis would be better for the researchers to use. If my students are aware of what a hypothesis is and that it needs to be a hypothesis just like a good objective that's not only tangible but that I can access good data, I can keep data for, then this type of a question is going to be fairly easy for them to answer. But if they don't have a clue of what a hypothesis should do and what the experimental design that's carried out should do, then I'd have no idea as a test taker what the correct answer to this question would be. So, how do we get started in our classrooms? Well, we teach the scientific method. We teach that experimental design through real-world application and reporting systems. Not about something that maybe a scientist would do somewhere, but things that happen in a student's life on a day-to-day -day basis. Because in order for them to better understand that, they need to be able to apply it to a real-world situation. So. You know, when I look at this graphic, it's a little bit daunting. So let's take apart for just a moment the basic steps of the scientific method. And when we look at that, the first step is that students need to observe and research their topic of interest. You know, it may be that I've observed that my weight has gone up. And so what I need to determine is what is happening what is the problem that could be solved through different experimentation? Well, I know what my problem is. It's called those late night, you know, nacho snacks. However, more on that later. But start with students understanding in a real world situation what observe is and what defining a problem means to them. So, well, for example, if we looked at that sample question, Environmental researchers were observing that the health of the desert biome was deteriorating. And they had also noted that there were fewer water, watering holes. So therefore, the researchers were interested in determining whether or not the number of watering holes impacted the desert biome. That was defining the problem. Of course, the next step of any good scientific design is to formulate a hypothesis. And oftentimes we call a hypothesis an educated guess. But it really is more. It, it's a prediction about how things work. And a hypothesis must be testable. And so an experimental investigation needs to be done because that hypothesis is testable. Um, most of our materials will say that the format of most hypotheses is if something happens, then something happens. So, you know, if soil temperatures rise, then plants are going to grow more quickly. Um, that's a testable hypothesis. Or if we go back to that previous question, if the number of watering holes increases, 
then the populations of desert animal species will increase. Because if I'm researching that, I can identify both the independent and the dependent variables of the experiment. You know, I once thought that independent and dependent variables were things I worried about in algebraic reasoning. But guess what? I can also use those in my scientific method. A really good way to say that that type of information transitions from one area to another. So as I'm looking at teaching my students a scientific design or scientific method, I do need to make sure they understand the terms, that they own the words of science. So they understand that an independent or manipulated variable is something that's intentionally varied by the experimenter. So if I'm eating all of these nachos, maybe I vary that so I only eat them once a week instead of seven nights a week. And that dependent or responding variable is a factor that can change as a result. So if I do that, maybe my weight goes down. A very simplistic approach, I know, but the kind of thing that we want to start with students. And so let's go back to that watering hole. If the number of watering holes is varied, then I would expect as the researcher that the population of desert animal species would change as a result of that. And you know, students need to understand that, again, independent is what's being changed, dependent is what is being measured. Now, it's not enough that I set up that hypothesis and I design my experiment. I also have to figure out how I'm going to gather all that information. And if you think about one of those science short answer types, that is one of the areas of the rubric. Has a student identified how data is going to be um, gathered? How it's going to, the procedure that's going to be followed? And so that's an important part of the scientific method. And I like to look at this as that replicatable part of the scientific design. If I've set up a procedure my students have and they've written it up, would I be able to do the same thing? Would I be able to replicate that? And along with this step of the scientific method, of course, comes more vocabulary, vocabulary that students need to own. And we all know there's many ways to teach vocabulary. We can teach it through the Freyer model. We can teach it through students drawing pictures, writing um, sentences. The most important thing is, can students not only define the words in their own words, but can they apply it to different situations? So again, lots of vocabulary strategies. The important thing is to use them. And then, of course, we're going to analyze those results after we've seen the results, after we've collected it. And we often say that there's still a whole lot of tables, graphs, photographs, a lot of graphic literacy on the GD test. But there's a lot of graphic literacy that's often seen on the scientific method as well. And then the last step for any scientific method, of course, is that conclusion where the student or the researcher has to either accept or reject the hypothesis. So, you know, again, back to that two, uh, type two question. If we go back to that previous question about the watering holes, we could say something like the researcher's hypothesis was correct when the number of watering holes was increased the populations of desert animal species increase by 50% as well. That's a scientific design. And when we look at that, if students understand each of those steps, they'll be better prepared to answer questions like we saw at the beginning of this webinar. Now, in scientific design, of course, all of the researchers and scientists also know that they need to be able to communicate their results. They need to be able to present that project to an audience, expect um, questions, as well as being able to answer those questions. That's an important part as we teach. It's not always assessed totally, you know, in some of the short answers, but just remember, again, very, very important. So why do we need to teach scientific method? Well, 
It provides students with the background knowledge, not only for the short answer, but also some of those technology enhanced questions. Um, when we're looking at those technology enhanced questions, we can see all types of questions that deal with scientific experimentation or design. So, if they can design a scientific investigation based on a given scenario and hypothesis, if our students can determine a method for collecting data, and if they can explain how they would evaluate the hypothesis, our students would be in better shape to not only do short answer type 2, but some of the other questions on the GED test. That's a big idea, scientific design. And it's a big idea that sometimes we don't have the opportunity to spend enough time doing. But how do we sometimes connect scientific design with some of the content knowledge from those thematic themes of the GED test? How can we put it all together? Well, we're going to spend just a little bit of time today showing you a couple sample lessons. Lessons that you can incorporate in your classroom but hopefully lessons that will get your own thought process and creative juices going because science is so much fun to teach and quite honestly my students loved it. They enjoyed what they were going to do each day in class. So let's take a look at building students scientific reasoning skills one experiment at a time. Now if you're like me you probably don't have a science lab. In fact, I think I've really only heard from a couple teachers who had science labs to use in their classroom. And they were science teachers during the day and teaching GED um, prep at night in their classrooms. But most of us do not have labs, and yet it does not need to be a fancy experiment to teach students the process. You know, it's often difficult to determine what kinds of content knowledge or big ideas students should have. GD Testing Service provide us, provided us with something called focusing themes, and the comment that they made a long time ago, actually before this test came out, was that all the questions on the science test would focus on one of the big ideas or the big themes. Those questions would be either aligned to human health and living systems, or they would be the question would be aligned with energy and related systems. And we all know that the content topics for this test come from life science, physical science, and earth and space science, with each of them approximately 40% for life, 40% for physical, and 20% for earth and space science as far as number or percentage of questions. Take a, a quick look at this particular slide. Please note that you also have a copy of this in your workbook in your guide on page four. But when you look at these focusing themes, I want you to look at the big ideas. Well, I think students really do need to know something about human health. I would think that would be an extremely important big idea. And how about how things work and motion and different forces and, of course, conservation of energy? Big ideas. And then I would really like to know a little bit about the structure and organization of the world in which I live and, and a little something about about the environment that's around me. What you don't see here are ideas that students have to have instant recall, but rather critical thinking skills. Some big idea background knowledge. So how do I teach a big idea? Researchers for a long time have said to teach the big ideas of science, a great strategy is to use the five E's that in order for students to best learn, they need to be engaged in the aspect of science. You need to capture their attention immediately. Students then need to be able to explore some of those concepts. They need to be able to do. And of course, we need to be able to explain, as do students need to explain to us, 
what they understand, what's some information they need, and we want them to elaborate, that they can transfer that knowledge to different areas of their life, to different content knowledge. And of course, we all know we need to evaluate, either formally or informally, with what they've learned. On page five of your guide, you have a brief overview of this instructional model. But we're going to go through it, and then we'll go back to that guide to show you the information that's provided. So we were talking a little bit about those focusing themes. So let's take two of them. Let's take one in energy and related systems and talk about how could we teach a lesson there. And then let's take one in, oh gosh, that wonderful world of biology called human health and living systems. But first, let's look at energy, something in the area of physical science. And so let's say I want to teach a lesson on some of the, oh gosh, the loss of motion. And it sounds a little boring maybe, but I think it's something my students need to know. They need those big ideas. So as I look at engaging students, I've got to find an activity that's going to focus their attention on what we're going to talk about. Maybe I do a demonstration or maybe they read something that's really interesting or, you know, brainstorming is always wonderful or I always love to show them a picture or graphic. Sometimes the things that they saw, they went, oh, wow, I never thought it looked like that. What I need to see in my classroom when I'm engaging students is that I, as the instructor, create some interest in what we're going to do and some curiosity in my students. I want them to be able to think about what questions they have. And as we're going through the lesson, they continually question what we're doing. And then, gosh, I want to make sure that their background knowledge is accessed. You know, our students have a lot of background knowledge in science. Sometimes it's not as accurate as we'd like it to be, but they have background knowledge, and I need to help them uncover what they know or think they know. And so what I want my students to do during the engage stage is ask questions, such as why did this happen or what do I already know or what have I found out? I want to grab their interest. So. One easy way to grab their interest is to use experiments. And experiments are a great way to teach some of those big ideas of science. You know, I'll never forget the first time I did this particular activity, which I now call objects fall at the same rate. What I did was, you know, I went into the classroom one day and I said, okay, I have an orange. And I actually have a grape. And I held them out in front of the students and I said, OK, which one's going to fall to the earth the most quickly? Which one's going to fall to earth first? And so I held this orange and this grape out there. And students looked at me. And of course, if your students are like mine, they would have said to you, oh, Bonnie, that orange is going to hit the ground first because it's a whole lot heavier than that grape. And so we all know that heavier things hit the ground first. So I did it. I performed the experiment for them. And guess what? They both hit the ground the same time. So what happened? They didn't believe me. They said, oh, I'm sure that you dropped the orange first. Try it again. So we tried it again. And at that point, guess what happened? The orange hit the ground first, or the orange did, and they said to me again, oh, Bonnie, we still don't think you're doing it right. So when they think that way, you have one of them do it. And what happened then was the experiment continued. Bottom line was that it continued to always go with they dropped, they hit the ground at the same time. Well, this is just engagement. I want them to hypothesize why it happened and how you could do something different. Now, you know, there, there's that story that Galileo discovered this rule by dropping different objects from the Leaning Tower of Pizza. And, you know, that continued on. We saw, oh, the same rule being dealt with by, you know, Newton and other people, and yes, I could show a quick film about it, 
but I may hold that for a little bit later. Right now, I just want to make sure my students are engaged and they're willing to go the next step. The next step of any good science teaching is to explore. And what we want here is for the activity that students go ahead and, and do a little further investigation or maybe solve a problem or construct a model. The explore process is very important for students to better understand the big idea or concept that you're trying to do. And so a great problem solving activity, sometimes we may do a little bit of direct instruction, but what we want students to do is to investigate, and so we provide time for them in the explore process. We do want students to think freely, but again, within the limits of the activity. This is where we want students to do a little bit of predicting and hypothesizing on their own, and then trying some different alternatives, and recording, of course, those observations and ideas. That last one of what the student does is really important in scientific design specifically, and that is we want them to suspend judgment. In the explore process, we want them to get all of that information in first, and not decide they know what the answer is before they finish up. So, I'm back to that lovely thing called gravity, I'm going to add a little bit of something called air resistance, and I'm going to have students do a short experiment. Remember I said we can do experiments in the classroom and they don't have to be difficult. In fact, for this experiment, all I have to do is divide my students into small groups, maybe three or four students, and give them each group four different pieces of paper. And I tell them what I need them to do is determine how air resistance affects the acceleration of falling objects. So, what I tell them is I want them to take a flat piece of paper, a loosely crumpled piece of paper, and a tightly crumpled piece of paper and determine which falls to the ground first if each is held at the same distance and released at the same time. Now most of our students, you know, they have those lovely things called smartphones, so they can record times that way. And if they don't, of course, we can always bring in some timers. But you'll notice that there is a fourth thing there, and it's called your paper design. I want students to hypothesize what shape may fall more slowly, or more quickly than the slowest or the fastest falling shape, and to determine why they think that will happen. So if, then. And then I want them to try it out and, again, decide which paper design will work more quickly or more slowly. And at this point, they may decide to explain to me a little bit of why it worked. Because in the explanation section, and that's the next step of the five E's, we want students to analyze their exploration and get their understanding to go a little deeper through reflective activity. This is where we as instructors will provide a little more explanation, maybe some reading materials, and some structured questioning. This is what clarifies students' understanding. We don't want students to just think they know something and to do, you know, some type of experimentation, but to never come to the content knowledge that they need to have. So, what are some sample activities, realizing that all of these, again, will be in your guide, but we want them to be able to analyze and explain. We want to support their ideas with evidence. If they had a shape that fell more quickly than any other shape, give me the reasons why. Give me the evidence. And of course, as teachers, we want to make sure that we structure the questioning, scaffolding it, but also doing text-dependent questions if we have them read an article. Questions that they have to read in order to answer. And this is, like I said, the time for each of us as instructors to provide that additional information that our students need. So, what does a teacher do? We encourage the students to explain in their own words. We ask for evidence. And then we formally provide more information. And we also want to always use students' previous ex experiences as a basis for explaining those big ideas or concepts. 
What do we want to see the students doing during, the, during this stage? We want them to explain possible solutions or answers. We want them to listen to how others are explaining what's happening and question those explanations. And of course, to listen and comprehend those explanations that as instructors we give. And definitely to reuse their recorded observations in their explanations. There are some fantastic things on the internet that are wonderful to use in the classroom. In fact, I'm always amazed at the creativity of teachers. So at this point, during this stage of the uh, lesson plan development process, I may explain Newton's three laws of motion. And to support that, I may wish to show a short video. If you've not gone out to see this specific uh, video, best idea ever, note that as you leave this webinar, just click into it and watch it. It is an absolutely amazing video by a teacher who's just created some very interesting graphics, quite amusing graphics, that grab a student's attention and really support some of the things with Newton's Law of Motion. So, we have three laws here. But I want students to better understand what one of those three laws is. So I'm going to choose Newton's second law of motion. And I may set up just a really bizarre type of um, scenario. And you can see the little elephant and the feather, the graphic on the right-hand side of this slide, going off a very tall building. So I tell students, okay, suppose an elephant and a feather are dropped off a very tall building from the same height at the same time. And suppose that air resistance could somehow be eliminated, you know, in our storybook world. Which object will hit the ground first? Um, I can't take credit for either the question or the graphic. It comes from an uh, internet site called the Physics Classroom, a great site if you are not you know, up to date on Newton's Law of Motion, which I will tell you this helped, but a great scenario to provide students. But it doesn't stop there. With explanation, then I can set up a more realistic one. Suppose that an elephant and a feather dropped off a very tall building from the same height at the same time, and assume the realistic situation that both feather and elephant encounter air resistance. Which object will hit the ground first? And of course I would add why. This provides really kind of an amusing way to look at Newton's second law of motion, but takes it the next step. While I'm explaining, again this is really a major part of course of any lesson, I also want to never forget the vocabulary. So if I'm looking at Newton's second law of motion, I want students to understand things like force and object and mass and acceleration. And you'll notice we even have a formula for force. These are big ideas. Students know what they look like in writing or reading, but they also know some real world applications. And I guarantee they will not forget the elephant and the feather. Uh, interesting or humorous way to bring home a big concept of physics. The next step in teaching the five E's is that we want to elaborate. We want to expand what students are thinking and apply it to real world situations. And this is where problem solving, decision making, experimental inquiry, and having students do such things as compare and contrast, classify or apply, really come in. And so at this level, what I would want to do is I would expect the, the students to be able to use those definitions and explanations that I've previously provided and I'd want them to be able to apply those concepts and skills in new situations. You know that's really important because when our students go to take the GED test they will have never seen those questions before. Very similar to when they take GED ready. Different questions. However, similar concepts from test to test, um, similar concepts from what we see in our materials. So what we want students to know and do is to know 
the big ideas, the big concepts, and then be able to do or apply them to different situations. And let's face it, there's no way we can come up with all the situations that would be possible for Newton's law of motion. So better for students to have a good understanding of the laws and some application in different areas. So as we look at this, there's a whole lot of strategies there, but those from Explore will also apply as we see whether students can apply those new definitions to not only similar situations, but new ones. And can they ask us questions? Can they make decisions? Can they propose solutions for problems? And back to, can they draw reasonable conclusions from evidence? That's an important part through all the tests, but also in science. As they're reading materials, test questions, can they come up with reasonable conclusions? Can they identify the evidence? And of course, we want them to record their observations and check for understanding with peers. So I could set up another situation for my students for them to elaborate. I may ask a question such as, would a tennis ball or bowling ball require more force to throw, and tell me why. Again, in the elaborate area, the activity should always have students being able to explain why their answer is correct. A simple step for elaboration. Last but not least, of course, we want to evaluate, have students learned what we have taught? Have they learned that big idea that we wanted them to learn? And there's a whole lot of suggested activities. Um, we can do a test, of course. We can develop a scoring tool. We can have them produce a product, um, all kinds of things, the kinds of things that we usually do when we evaluate. The one thing I'd like to suggest, though, when we evaluate students in science, especially when we've been doing scientific design, one evaluative route is to observe them as they're applying new concepts and skills. So it's not always um, having something in writing, but oftentimes, can we observe what they do? Also, asking those open-ended questions. Why do you think? What evidence do you have? That requires that students dig a little bit deeper to answer. We laughingly say that real life is not always multiple choice, and we know it's not on the GED science test either, but more importantly that they understand well enough that they can answer those open-ended questions through observations, evidence, or some of the explanations they've had. We want our students to also evaluate um, their own knowledge of what we've done. So if I'm teaching something in the area of physics and we're teaching um, these things about laws of motion, can students evaluate what they know? Can they set up examples on their own? Can they answer and ask related questions? So what would that look like? Well, there's a whole lot of things I could do in evaluation with my lesson on Newton's law of motion. I could have my students provide an example of the law and have them explain why it's a good example. Maybe they draw a picture or maybe they demonstrate it to the class. If a student can do that, I as the instructor know that he or she understands that law. Or I could have students describe how the second law of motion applies to everyday objects. Many, many different ways to evaluate. The important thing is to include this as an important part of the five E's. So a quick lesson, quick lesson plan example, that there's so many other ways to add to it, dependent upon your students, dependent upon your materials, dependent upon your program. And we could expand it, we could delete things, but it does set up the five E's. Okay, let's go one more time. Let's look at life science and, and human health and living systems. We know that that is a big idea. That is a thematic part of the GED science test. If you've not ever gone out to TED Ed uh, education, they have some absolutely wonderful videos. And so I could do a lesson on bacteria and antibiotics because 
I know that when I look at some of the assessment targets content uh, wise from GD testing service that disease prevention and, and different diseases, all of those things are part of content. So to engage students, I could have them watch that video. And it's a great video. Again, it was developed by teachers. You probably already note that, again, it's somewhat humorous as a cartoon. So I'm going to engage my students that way. And I may even ask them for some real life experiences. After they watch the video, I'm going to set it up so that I know they have the who, what, when, where, and why of the video. And if you're interested in watching it, you've got the URL right there. So I have engaged students. I've engaged them into that, you know, kind of interesting world of bacteria and antibiotics, things that we can't usually see bacteria. And most of us don't have you know, the ability to have a high level microscope in the classroom. So let them watch a video. Let's use the internet for those things. Well, to explore, I could have students read a pro-con article. Um, in fact, there's a good one, Antibiotics, Understanding the Pros and Cons by Dr. Kara Natterson, who um, is a physician from well, her education was from Harvard and John Hopkins, I believe. So she provides some pros and cons. And I think pros and cons, hmm, I could connect that to reasoning through language arts. But what I want students to do is compare those two sides and construct an argument for me that goes for or against prescribing antibi antibiotics. I want them to use evidence from the article. So that's providing them with an uh, activity for their exploration. Well, when I ha go through explain, I want to identify and summarize some major ideas for them. And as the instructor, maybe I'm going to go ahead and define some basic vocabulary terms that I want them to understand and talk about the cause and effect of the overuse of antibiotics. And there are a lot of articles, a lot of materials out there that will help me as the instructor provide that type of information. But I also want to, as I explain, have my students think a little bit about what they think would happen if a person takes the same antibiotic six times in one year. Is that too much? Is that too little? Would that have any effect on an antibiotic's usefulness? Because the important thing for my students to understand are, again, can they think critically about what they are reading? Well. In this lesson, in the Elaborate, maybe I set up a scenario and I want them to extend their learning into this scenario. And I say, okay, you've got a farm and, and you're raising livestock. I want you to use the information that you've learned. And I want you to decide whether you would give all of your livestock antibiotics as a preventive measure. Why or why not? Again, they're going to take all of that information they've learned from the lesson and in the elaborate section of the lesson, extend that knowledge to a different type of situation. Of course, I have to also evaluate. And this one looks similar to that type of format that we have in the short answer, but I've not given students the, the scenario. I've not given them the background information they often see on the science test. But what I'm asking them to do is to design an experiment that will measure when people begin to feel better after taking antibiotics. Conduct the experiment and report your results in narrative and graph form. Now, note that I'm not having them say they will or they won't. Do they agree? Do they not agree? What I want is an experiment, one that I could replicate after I've read what students have written. So just another example during the evaluate of a way to, again, test what students know. So two examples using the five E's, and those examples really do work very well as we are looking at the different types of questions that GD testing service has in their science test. Because remember, 
We have the technology enhanced items such as the one we saw at the beginning of this webinar, but we also have those big ideas of science that have to go into the short answers. So just a couple things here. We're not going to dig any deeper into short answers, but as we look at the types, note the first one, students have to respond to textual stimulus material and examine relationships. If we're teaching using the five E's, students have the background knowledge and they have the critical thinking skills to read those types of textual stimulus materials to determine relationships and, just as importantly, to craft an answer that effectively answers the question. Short answer type two has students designing a scientific investigation and then describing that experiment. And we all know that many of our students may not be getting as many points on this, but if we've gone through scientific investigation in the classroom in a multitude of different ways, if we've used something as in-depth as the five E's, then our students will do better on this short answer type because they will know that when they're given a hypothesis, how they should set up an investigative design, what types of ways to collect the evidence, to collect the data, and then how to determine or evaluate the results, all parts of a short answer. So having said that, I've referred to the guidebook. And before we spend a little bit of time um, with the questions and the comments, and I know that we have some, some great comments that are coming through, so I want to make sure we all have time to share. I want to spend just a few moments showing you what you do have in the guidebook and hopefully how it can be helpful to you in the classroom. Okay, I think we're somewhat positioned here. This is the guide that you have, and it's information resources and a few strategies for the classroom. I just want to let you know um, a little bit about what you have here before we open it up. The way the guide is set up is, first of all, you do have the list of high impact indicators, all of them, as well as what to look for in student work. I find that to be extremely helpful as I'm looking at developing lesson plans. This is one of those things that what I would suggest for you to do is to take a look at those indicators and take a look at what students should be able to do. And if you don't have lessons that cover those areas, that's where you really need to dig a little deeper and develop a lesson that um, applies to those concepts. You also have the science themes that we had talked about. And those science themes, um, again, just a little easier to read. Realizing that all of the different content for the test is also in the assessment guide. But this provides those big ideas, those thematic areas. You also have um, some information on the five E's for your reading pleasure. And with that, not only do you have the paragraph process, but you also have an overview of them with the role of the teacher and what students should be able to do, um, which is on the PowerPoint. I always find that when I'm planning with the five E, something as simple as just a little table really helps me to better outline what I want to do. You also have a little bit about that scientific inquiry method, and I know that um, we already have some comment about inquiry-based learning that allows the students to drive the questions, and great idea because that is so true. It helps our students really invest in the outcome 
of what they're learning. You've got a couple pages that will just provide you with some information for the instructional process, such as some questions for guiding scientific thinking. And then you have a number of simple, and I do mean simple experiments that you can do in the classroom. There are so many different websites with experiments and some of them are very easily done in our adult education classrooms, some a little more difficult. And we provided you with a whole lot of websites that you can take a look at for the different types of experiments. What we provided here are just a few in each of the areas to get students thinking about things, a great way to engage, um, you know, everything from how far are planets from you, uh, life science, how strong are you, and what happens there. A few in the area of physical science and chemistry. Again, simple experiments that students can learn how to uh, integrate the scientific design. Susan and I have often done this one of how large is an atom and it's a lot of fun because students can really see just the, the smallness of the atom and there are a couple great um, videos that support that. So again, it gives students visuals. And if you haven't done great balls of goop and ooey gooey and ooh black and flubber, uh, a little bit messy, however, well worth the time and the excitement that students usually have. Last but not least in your guide, I'm scrolling up, I know, fairly quickly, and I'll wait for it to get in front, is you do have some science resources from the World Wide Web. There are so many things out there, just a couple that um, I just want to tell you about. One is the Annenberg Learner, and the Annenberg Learner is a great site for um, our, profession, our personal professional development. Great materials, there's one on force and motion, one on the habitable planet, and of course in all of the other areas in, as well. But great, great site. Don't overlook the fact that there are many fine science museums that have activities on site that students can visit. Many of my students were never able to visit a science museum, but they got so excited when they saw some of the many different displays that were available on some of these. And so many of these sites also provide our students with access to really seeing things through microscopes. Um, absolutely marvelous websites out there and I would tell you go ahead and explore them, have some fun with them. One other thing and if you've been with Susan and me before, you know that there are a lot of websites out there that we enjoy using because they give our students current and up-to-date up articles. One of them is Newzella and that's at the top of this page and when you, if you've not gone out to Newzella, Newzella has some great articles, brand, you know, new articles come out almost daily. And there are articles for both science and health. What I really like about this site is all articles are written um, at five different Lexile levels. So if I'm teaching a big idea of science, then I can print five different readability levels of the article, have students read them at, the, at their own level, but I'm teaching one idea to the whole class. So if you've never gone out to Newzella, please do so. If you do not have access to always doing experiments that you want to do, don't forget that there are a number of websites, especially if you have access to the internet and at least one computer projector and screen. Or for me, it was oftentimes the wall of the classroom. Newton's Apple, Steve Spangler, Bill Guy or Bill Nye, the Science Guy, and of course Ted Ed are great sites to see those types of resources. So, having said that, I do know that we have some questions as well as some great ideas. So before we go to a closing, we want to open it up for questions and ideas that we can share and questions that we can answer. So Mimi and Teresa, what questions do we have out there and what kinds of information can we share? 
Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, um, our first question is, what scientific formulas do the students need to know and why isn't there a list of scientific formulas like there is for math? I'm actually going to turn that over to Daf Daphne or Debbie because my first thought is scientific formulas needing to know them from just memory do not exist. But Daphne, can you further elaborate? Hi, Bonnie. Yes, um, I can. Um, usually, why they're not on a separate sheet is that if there's a need for them um, as part of an item, they are actually supplied to the students um, for them to, to utilize in terms of answering the question. So, as Bonnie said, because this is not a, um, a recall test and it is one that involves reasoning skills, um, students would bring the same kinds of skills that they might deploy in other content areas to science, um, as Bonnie indicated at the, um, at the beginning. So, no, we don't really need um, a separate formula sheet um, for science, but as Bonnie also pointed out during the webinar, um, understanding um, the formulas associated with the big ideas in science um, is helpful, um, but it isn't from a rote perspective. It's really understanding um, how they power and influence um, the world around the student. Okay, is that does that sound good? Are we good for the next question? Yes, let's go ahead. Okay, um, so we had one comment saying that their biggest challenge is that they are not a certified science teacher. Do you have any tips for them um, as they're teaching science in the classroom? Yes, I do, because I'm not a science certified teacher either, and yet have found myself having to teach science not only um, for adult education, but also in the K through 12 system and alternative ed. The one thing that I really like about the GED test science-wise is it really is about science, um, so much of it, about the science of, of daily life. And the type of experiments that we're sharing with you in the guide are experiments that you can do without a lab. And when we look at so many of the areas, human health and living systems, those are things that we're very familiar with. I selected today doing one on um, antibiotics and bacteria because most of us have taken antibiotics. We know what we should do. Disease and human health, things which are part of our life on a daily basis. Remember that as students go through science, what we all need to make sure is that they have really effective close reading skills, that as they read materials, they understand what they've read, they've been able to pull evidence, and they can critically think through the process. So as we're doing this, I think what you're going to find when you go through some of the websites are some great resources that you can develop lessons with and some great resources that you can use for experiments without being a certified science teacher. I'm also going to say if you have additional questions, please email GD Testing Service. I hate to say I have a million of them, but I can share some things that I know I've used as well in the classroom. But hopefully, after listening to some of the information today, you will definitely try some of the activities. Okay, um, our next comment is, some of the challenges we face when teaching science are that students lack the knowledge and basic math and reading skills. This really inhibits their ability to access the higher level activities and thinking skills required for science. Do you have any tips or advice for this educator? You're so correct, but if the math skills and the reading skills are not there, they're going to have a difficult time, not only in science, but in RLA, social studies, and in math. One of the things that we've done in previous webinars is we've talked about close reading skills, and that very much is a step-by-step -step 
process and oftentimes our students get a little frustrated because they don't want to take a step-by-step -step process but they do need to do that one of the other things as you're teaching RLA is ensure that you are teaching nonfiction texts that have a science base. That way, as you're teaching strategies such as close reading, they're not only learning those strategies, but they're gaining some knowledge about science as well. I think if you'll look at the, the thematic areas that are on this test and you identify some articles such as those on Newzella or on TED-Ed, those types of things and use those in your science classroom, your students will grow in using the words of science and learning a little more about science. Um, basic math, yes, you're, you're so correct. Many of our students do have some basic math uh, skills lacking because on science, of course, we know that data, statistics, etc., those types of questions exist. And if they can't do basic math, there again, they're not ready for some of the skills that are being required on either the math test or science and social studies when they have to do those, those tests or those skills. Um, so my comment, and I'll ask Daphne and Debbie too, is step by step. First, students need to be able to closely read. From closely reading different science articles, they can then at, uh, basically acquire science vocabulary in the math class as they're learning basic math skills, having them apply those skills to statistics, to graphs, charts, and tables, first at the very easy level or lower level of skills, and then raising up with difficulty. Um, Daphne or Debbie, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, this is Daphne, um, yes. Um, the other thing that um, I think that uh, instructors have a great opportunity to do um, is to uh, model how you interact with the content and the concepts for your students. Um, you know, part, you can't lecture about higher order thinking skills. The way if students don't have them as part of their foundation, it's usually because they haven't seen them demonstrated, nor have they had a chance to practice them. Um, so modeling gets to be one of the better ways to teach. It's not the only way, but it certainly is um, a great way to introduce higher order thinking skills. Um, as well, it, it, um, it also applies uh, for uh, RLA and close reading. Um, we had an experience um, uh, recently at a, um, a training that we conducted in Colorado where one of the attendees said that her, she was working one-on-one -on -one with a student who had an epiphany, um, which we would wish probably many students would have, that you have to actually think when you read. Um, and for many of the people on this call, that's a given. Um, but for a lot of our students, it isn't a given. And so sometimes we have to, you know, assume the role of the learner and demonstrate just how it's done. That's excellent. And I'm just going to comment because a couple of things came in. Anything um, in the guide, et cetera, please feel free to use. Please feel free to apply it with students. There are a number of different materials. Um, I know working with many states, sometimes state um, websites also have a number of lesson plans that you can use for free. But yes, anything within today's webinar, please use with your classroom. It's, you know, it's why we are doing what we are doing today. Um, so hopefully with that, that will work a little bit. Um, what is the next question? Yes. The next question is, um, and you may have just touched on this, where can I find more examples to help my students design an experiment? There are so many things out there. Um, in fact, I'm in Florida, and we just developed a couple step-by-step -step lesson plans for our website here. But you'll also find that a number of those websites that are included in the back of your guide have lessons as well. So hopefully that will get you started. Um, 
there, there really is so much out there. The only caution I would give you, as you start looking at lesson plans for lesson plans, make sure that you're defining what you need in your curriculum to teach the um, assessment targets, high impact indicators. Because oftentimes we go, go out, and I know I do, I see so many things I want to incorporate everything. So a couple lessons taught deeply on the scientific method will be much more effective than trying to teach lots of things. All right, um, the next question we have is, are there any good resources for the topics mentioned that are in Spanish for educators who are teaching the materials in Spanish and English? I know that a few of the websites, and I apologize, I can't tell you immediately which ones, can be translated into Spanish. I do know that there has, you know, basically there have not been a lot of materials, although I have seen a couple more publishers placing their materials into Spanish. But there again, um, there are some resources that are in the back of that book, which if you go out to, you'll see they are both in, sp they are in English and then can be, the website can be changed over to Spanish. But you are correct. There are not nearly as many things as we would like to see. Um, Daphne or Debbie, Spanish materials coming out. Not that I'm aware of. This is Debbie. I'm sorry. I, I don't think I have anything other to add than what you've already discussed with them, Bonnie, unfortunately. Yeah. Good. Um, not good, but yes. Agree. Yeah. Not good, but that's the not answer. Not good. Yeah. Okay, um, and then this question came in, where do I get the workbook you keep referring to? Do you want me to take that or? Please do. Sure. Um, well, for starters, if you look in the material section of um, your go-to webinar um, screen, um, there will be two uh, PDFs that you can download. The workbook is there. Um, additionally, you'll be getting, and you should have received, and you'll also be getting a follow-up email from us, and that will include a link to the website where you can download the materials. And actually, I'll go ahead and chat that link um, in the chat box right now, so you can you can find it easily. Um, okay, and then the next question is, how can we use this information with a combination class, meaning high school diploma recovery with a few GED students? Would we be able to make the handouts just for our GED students? Yes, you can. And how do you incorporate? Um, high school recovery programs are so different from state to state. But remember that the GED test is aligned with those standards. So what you would need to do is all students need to be able to know about experimental design. So what I would do is to teach lessons that you know incorporate all the different levels of students, etc. that are those big ideas. Knowing that my students who are in high school recovery may need um, some additional information, let's say they are taking chemistry in your class, than what I would need to teach to a GED student. However, having said that, some of those big ideas are those big ideas, such as scientific design. Okay. Um, our next question is um, a question about um, my, I have a number of students who are, do you have any tips for students who are pregnant and dealing with uh, those students who have health issues on their mind? That's an interesting one because I ran a pregnancy program. And when I look at life uh, sciences, I think of all the things that I could have done with my students there because what I would need to do, or what I would do, is to identify some of the things they're interested in and teach those big ideas. You said that some of them have health issues. So instead of teaching about antibiotics and diseases, although it may be appropriate, um, I could teach about antibiotics and why we we may not use them as frequently when we're pregnant, or I could talk about some of the problems that I have during my pregnancy or the development of 
my baby and all of these things that can bring in so easily into that lovely area of life science. Remember, we do not as practitioners know what source materials are going to be on this test. What we know are those big ideas as you saw with the high impact indicators of what students need to do with that. Um, you know, even with moms, Let's talk about what the little one's going to look like and, and when I look at heredity, all of those issues. So start out with something that's going to be engaging to them because if they're engaged, then you can always pull additional information. But to me, that's where I would start with expectant moms is, again, focusing on the concerns of theirs that are science-based and then going from there. Okay, um, those are all of the questions that have come in so far. One other question we got was asking about a certificate of participation. And just so you know, you'll be getting an email in, pro in about two days, and that will include a link to download your certificate of participation. So, unless then there I'd are like, any other questions. I was going to say, then I'd like to just share a few comments that have come in um, from some of your cohorts. Uh, Austin Cron says, good science is not about how many answers you know, it's how you behave when you don't know. And, you know, he's indicated the quote is from unknown. I thought, that is so true. It really is about that problem-solving process, that critical thinking, um, especially if I don't know the answer. And also people are recommending that Students do enjoy and learn better when they're involved in an experiment or research. Demonstrations are good if you can involve the student, and that came from Rosetta Somerset. Um, Rosetta, thank you for that idea as well. She also said that keeping a balanced aquarium in the classroom is a simple way to illustrate and explain some ecological concepts, and also students like to see it, so another great idea. Um, Austin came back and said there's many science experimental apps in the tablet score, stores which are free and interactive. Don't forget the fact that yes, many of our students do have those wonderful smartphones and there really are some great apps, many of them free. So thank you for both of those um, comments. Yolanda Brooks has, has agreed that modeling is the key and Yolanda, yes you are correct. And Luz has something on Spanish students out of Spanish GED 365 and biology resources from the same site. Um, and so can we just post that so that folks can see, Teresa and Mimi? Yes, those have been, um, you can access those materials and you can see them in the chat area. Okay, great. And we thank you for those. Um, those ideas because that really is wonderful. And one suggestion, and it goes without saying, it says if one is not a certified teacher in a certain field, be sure you do the lesson yourself several times prior to teaching the lesson. Um, I observed a teacher trying to teach the scientific method but did not understand what it was. What I would recommend is it really, not just those of us who may or may not be certified, when we're going to teach a lesson, we all need to do that little bit of practice so that we have a, a good understanding of what we're teaching and, of course, research so that we know that what we're teaching and how we're teaching it is research-based. And we're we have a few moments left for additional um, questions. Some great questions have come in, and I love also hearing the comments, what things you're doing, and some suggestions. Absolutely wonderful. It looks like we have another question that came in. Do you advocate, advocate using dimensional analysis and problem solving some of the scientific questions asked? Um, Daphne or Debbie, would you like to comment on that? Because I, you know, what I have is access to those things you have, but on the um, operational test in GED Ready, I don't know. Um, 
Sorry, I think we were both on mute. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of dead space there, but I'm not sure I have any comment to add from the operational test. This may be something we need to take offline, and uh, Marty Kay is the person uh, who could really dig and give us the correct answer on that. That's a little deeper into the actual operational test mechanics than I'm uh, accustomed to dealing with. So we'd be happy to answer the question and, and route this to Marty Kay if we can do that. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Well, it looks like those are all of the questions. Mimi, okay. did, any, did we get any questions in over Twitter? Uh, we did not. I think you've covered all of them. Okay, great. Okay, um, we hope that today's webinar got you started thinking a little bit. Um, my final thoughts are, thoughts are really to increase science reading and writing skills. Each student needs to read like a detective and write like an investigative reporter. And that came out of a gentleman who is the co-author of the ELA standards. Remember that although this is, quote, science, our students still need effective reading and writing skills and, of course, math skills for some of those areas. So it's not just about content. It's also about all those base skills that go across not only this test, but also across skills that we need in real world and post-secondary ed. So as we finish up today, Please know that if you've not accessed the GEDTestingService.com website and signed up for in session, please do so. The other thing is the GED Testing Service does have a resource guide for the short answer questions and has scoring tools for each of the different short answer items. So if you're not aware of those two things, please, please access gedtestingservice.com and make sure that you have downloaded those materials. There are sometimes just so many materials and oftentimes you're just a little bit overwhelmed by them. The other thing is, um, after this webinar is over, if you will, please just take a few moments to complete a survey. Um, this is a series of webinars, and we always want to make sure that we have information from the field so that as new webinars are developed, et cetera, that we're providing what teachers need. One of the comments I've always felt very strongly about was whether I did a workshop, a webinar, et cetera. I wanted those who were participating to leave with something new they could use. And so I hope today that as we have gone through this webinar that you have um, obtained at least one new thing that you didn't know about or one new thing that you want to use either from the information that we've provided from GD testing service or the fantastic information that we've received from those of you in the field. So having said that, any comments, Debbie or Daphne in closing? I would just like to thank everybody for because I we know what kind of um, schedules that you guys live with um, and want to you know absolutely thank each and every one of you who made the time to be on this webinar uh, this afternoon um, to also um, thank you for the incredible job that you are doing with your students. Um, and as Bonnie said, I hope that you can, each of you can take away one thing from this webinar that you can go back and try in your classroom. Um, because in the end, um, that's what really matters to us. So thank you. And this is Debbie. I echo the sentiments and I'm very happy to have you all with us. And it's uh, always nice to know that not only do you uh, take the time to sit in with us, but many of you share the access through the recorded webinars with your colleagues. So we uh, appreciate that opportunity to reach more of you, but certainly to have you all as the front line to help uh, disseminate this information. So thank you very much. So Teresa and Mimi, thank you for everything you do. As you can see on this page, if you do have additional questions, you have Daphne and Debbie's email. But know that you can always send 
questions as well to communications at gdtestingservice.com. So on behalf of GD Testing Service, this is Bonnie. I thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Have a great rest of the week, guys, and a wonderful holiday season. Thank you. Bye.